and welcome to episode 105 of Real Life Ghost Stories. How you do? To kick things off this week, we need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. We would like to thank Natalie Consalvi, Anita, Amy, Sarah Johnson, George and Neen, Joshua Carfield, Christian Williams, Sydney Roberts, Trey Goody, Kimmy Curry, Angela Hash, Laura Davison, Jen, Atari Zot, Damon Cunningham, Derika Marte, Aaron Mott, Chastity Titchnell, Kelsey Kaspari, Lisa Watts, Aaron, Laura W, Carl Phillips, Terry Kay, Tamila Tamarovich, Rohan Kent. You could really hear our faltering in I, mean, the, if I don't I... know why. One of the names, I can't remember which one it was, but I said as a question, I really apologise if that was you. I don't really know why that was the way that my voice decided to inclinate it, but it wasn't a question. It's clearly your name. <laughs> I'm sorry. There were quite a few in there as well. We're halfway through. You can hear me go, really? Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, no. Thank you so much for being our Patreon subscribers. We appreciate you every single day and you are wonderful. Thank you. Our film review this week. Our film review is Sleepwalkers. Sleepwalkers was released in 1992. It has 5.3 out of 10 on IMDb and 29% on Rotten Tomatoes. Would you like a synopsis? I'd love one. A nomadic mother-son duo of energy vampires settle in a remote town and hunt for virgin women to feed on. They soon find their new victim in Tanya Robertson, a girl in high school. And I think it's important to note at this point, before we go any further, that this is an adaptation of an unpublished Stephen King short story, first of all. And second of all, there will be spoilers. Because this isn't a good one. I mean, this is one of the most bizarre films we've watched in a very long time. So what were your thoughts? Okay, so there's a big elephant that we need to talk about at some point. I'm going to put that to one side. Because... The basic premise of this film is that this mother and son have been kicked out of their previous town for killing cats and people, which is obviously something you probably should be arrested for and punished for. And they've gone to another town and the son kind of vaguely has got a love interest, but is also trying to lure this young girl into his den so that his mother can feast on her. That's the story. That's the premise, right? Yeah. And the cats, cats don't like these beings, whatever they are. So the energy vampires, the beings of that. Yeah, their, their kryptonite is cats. Yeah. So that's the basic story, which on the surface doesn't sound too bad. Like it, it's a bit out there, but it's like... But we also need to point out as well, before we go any further, that like there's Dr. Sleep is all over this film, you Absolutely. know? That you've got your energy vampires and they, they feast on people in the same way. So they don't like drink blood. They suck their life force from them. You've got this really sensual woman who is very reminiscent of Rose the Hat. You know, so so there's a, it's like, you know, Dr. Sleep was a bit more tightening up of those ideas. Yeah. A, a lot more, a lot more tightening <laughs> yes. up of those ideas. A lot more. T- and that's where the problem comes in. Because the premise of it, actually, as a Stephen King horror as a horror film, a, a monster flick, whatever you want to call it, works. The problem is the way that it is extrapolated and expanded on is chaotic. The biggest problem I have with this is I do not understand why you need to write your antagonists as incestuous beings. I don't know why we had to have the mother and son having sex with each other. Re- like, And it wasn't just implied that they had sex with each other i mean it was uncomfortable in the first five minutes when you when you had all of these cats that had been brutally murdered in a town and randomly mark hamill as a police officer in the first five minutes Mm. who you never see again in the film credited either no it was so strange but you know that that's i mean that was dark enough and i was found found mark hamill mark hamill and (laughs) murdered cats and i found that quite upsetting and then suddenly he's calling her mom while shifting the face off her and then they have this really gratuitous sex scene why did we need that we we got it they were in an incestuous relationship we didn't need a hot steamy sex scene lots of close contact as well and really like lingering scenes of a romantic nature between the mother and the son it starts off with him like fawning over a high school yearbook with a picture of a girl in it and then he goes down and talks to his mom and you're like okay 
and then literally, like Emma said, it just cuts to them suddenly embracing embracing each other and ta- him taking her up into the bedroom. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't know why. Why, does, why is this necessary? Does this need to be in here? Does it add anything to the story? Nope, none whatsoever. I'm pretty sure you could build a good mother son relationship without the romantic angle. I don't understand. I might miss something. We often do. I think we've got to say at this point, we've said it before in the lodgers. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Absolutely. And incest is is always wrong. So we're we're not we're not okay with it. And uh, that's we have to leave it there with the incest because otherwise yeah. I'll rant for a million years about the incest. Yeah. The thing that really bothers me about this is well, the other thing that really bothers me about this apart from that is that Stephen King's written himself quite a, a relatively lengthy part for him in terms of a cameo in that he says three lines and he's on screen for about two or three minutes, which means that he's on board with it. And then if you think about The Shining and how good that was and how he wasn't on board with it, it just makes you wonder what Kubrick cut out. Well, I, it's it's difficult to know, isn't it? And I wonder if... I, I've had conversations about The Shining and Doctor Sleep with people since we watched them. And people were talking about how, like, the misery... Um, not the misery, misery, The Shining, whatever, had a lot of allegorical references to Stephen King's addiction issues. And maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't feel like in The Shining the the issue of addiction was addressed appropriately. And actually, I don't. I don't really know if it was. However, with this film, I just wonder if it was so insane and ridiculous that he was like, "Yeah, this is a bit of fun. Why not? Like, why? Let's just. I'm just going to be in it." Yeah. You've got a police officer who drives around, and his sidekick is a little cat called Clovis. Who is the best character in the entire film? All of the cats down. are the best characters in the film. If you've got a film where cats save the day, I'm all for it. But this, the only thing I liked about this film was the fact there was loads of cats in it. There was loads of shots of just loads of cats running through the streets, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And they saved the day. So that's that's what the only saving grace for this film. I enjoyed, for the wrong reasons, the fact that someone had clearly directed the lead girl Um that in order to show that you are interested in someone, you need to continuously bite your bottom lip. Because I I think you need to pause for a second because you just said, I enjoyed for the wrong reasons the fact that the lead girl continuously bit her lip. (laughs) It wasn't, I don't think it was what they were going for, but I found it horrendously funny because it was just... Constant. Constant and just unnecessary and just seemed to be like every time she took a breath, she was biting on her bottom lip and it was like, I get it. I get it. I got it the last 22 times you did it. You don't need to carry on. But it, do you know what? With the incest in a box to one side, I actually quite enjoyed it for what it was, which was a mess. But I enjoyed it for being a mess. An absolute mess. And I don't, I can't cope with the violence against the animals in it. Like it's, I mean, it's pretty dark what happens to some of the cats in it. And it, and it made me feel really uncomfortable. But they I would revenge. I would recommend using the website doesthedogdie.com. That will help you to decide whether or not you want to watch a film. But it was just bizarre. And I also don't understand these these vampires took on a human form, but they also shape-shifted and they became these weird, like, giant sphinx cats mm. where they had no fur but were weirdly cat-like. And then they also could go invisible but they also could change the shape of the cars that they were. It was very strange. You very say it's strange. strange. But how many vampires do you know? Well, listen, that's a very good point. Maybe mm. what I know about vampires is completely wrong. Exactly. So, what would you give this film out of five? I'm giving it a three. That's rogue. Because I, to be honest, I would watch it again if it was on, or if I was to put the Blu-ray back in the machine. <laughs> like I would watch it again. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a three for me. I think, do you know what? I think I'm going to give it a two. And the reason is, there's two reasons. Number one, the cats are awesome in it. And I love a good cat. Number two, it probably was the most inventive use of corn on the cob yes. in a film that I've ever seen. So I'm giving it two just for that inventiveness Fair because play. I've never seen anything like it. Which brings us to our story this week. And I'm kind of apprehensive about this story because it's incredibly dark and incredibly frightening but also incredibly sad so we're not going to do our usual pre-story debrief we're just going to get straight into it are you ready ready to the people of the bustling cities of the south 
the people of the North seemed almost to be the object of folklore. They lived a life that was backward to some. In ancient times, the North was a place of ghouls and goblins and people who were hard as nails. In reality, they were just farming communities who provided crop that fed much of the country. These rural towns and villages, surrounded by a bountiful sea and rolling fields of crops, seemed to advance slower than the rest of the country, which is common in rural communities everywhere. Even when Wi-Fi and high-speed train lines snaked their way to the north, the people held on to the beliefs that perhaps were forgotten elsewhere in the country. And in particular, they held on to beliefs about the dead. Because some people of the north believe that the dead never truly leave and that they exist behind a thin curtain that separates the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. And sometimes small tears would appear in this thin fabric, giving the living brief glimpses of those who were long gone. In 2011, a cab driver was sitting in a desolate town. Business was not good and had not been good for some months. Times were hard in the north and there was not much call for taxis. He sighed, exasperated and becoming more aware of the growing, gnawing anxiety that was in the pit of his stomach. How would he feed his family? When was this going to get better? Would life ever return to normal? He decided he would do another lap of the town and was so engrossed in his own worries that he almost missed her. If anything, he was shocked to see her. This area of town had not fared well and he lurched to a halt at the sight of another human being. But she was definitely hailing him down. And relief washed over him. A fare meant money. It wasn't until she got into the car that he realised something wasn't right. She was soaking wet, completely drenched from head to toe, with water dripping from her long dark hair. She was also inexplicably wearing a winter coat, despite the fact that it was high summer and the sun was beaming in the sky. He looked at her in the rearview mirror. So where am I taking you? he asked. She told him where she wanted to go, and he asked her to repeat herself, thinking he had misheard. She repeated herself, and there was a pause. But why do you want to go there? There's nothing there anymore. He asked, but gently, because she seemed to be in no fit state for questioning. There was a long pause. In that pause, he heard her rattling breath and the chattering of her teeth. Finally, she spoke in a whisper. Have I died? He looked up into the rearview mirror again and turned to look in the back seat and aghast he realised that she was gone. She had vanished in the time it took her to finish her sentence and for him to look in the rearview mirror. And he knew what had happened. He didn't need to try and rationalise what had happened or try and make excuses because the whole town was haunted and everyone was catching glimpses of the dead. The dead were everywhere. Their eyes were in puddles and they watched from windows. He was not the only cab driver to pick up a passenger that asked to go to a long lost destination and disappear mid-journey. There was an unspoken acceptance that this was the way the world was now, that the dead and the living were coexisting, and that the dead were making themselves known. Meanwhile, in the local fire station, the call-out alarm was ringing. The firemen were weary. Call-outs were much more frequent now. A young fireman checked the location and went very still and very pale. An older, more experienced fireman noticed. He watched him freeze and watched the colour drain from his face. He took the young man's arm and asked, Again? 
The young man didn't look but nodded mutely, still staring at the address. We have to go, he said. It doesn't matter what we already know, it is our job. We'll deal with it when we get there. Being called out to a fire always brings an atmosphere of tense anticipation. Excitement isn't really the right word, but being a fireman was unpredictable. But a pattern was emerging in the town. A call would come from an area of town. A voice would frantically ask for help. The firemen would diligently attend the scene, but would know before they even arrived that the house the call had come from had been burned or destroyed months before. In some places, the houses had been destroyed right down to the foundations. Much like the taxi drivers, the fire crew developed their own ritual of quiet acceptance. They would attend the scene of the call. There would be no fire. It had long been extinguished and the passing of time rendered the area a wasteland. They would exit the truck and they would pray. They did this every time a call came in. And eventually, the ghost calls stopped. It was late. She was alone in her house at the top of a hill and it was pitch black. She was preparing dinner and was settling into her dinner time routine when it happened. There was a sharp and frantic knock on her door. She froze and listened. Had she imagined it? Who in the world would be knocking on her door at this time? Then there it was again. A definite knock on the door. She had a split-second decision of whether to open the door and she decided that it could be someone in need. So she opened it. There, standing on her doorstep and shivering in the cold, was a woman. They were about the same age, middle-aged. But this woman looked desperate and pleading. She was dripping wet. Please help me, I am so cold. The woman stared for a second, shocked, and then jumped to action. Of course, of course, just wait one second. She raced and got clean, dry clothes and a towel for the woman and ran back to the door to give them to her. She closed the door and rested with her back to it, breathing heavily. Oh, that poor woman. It was so cold and she was wet to the skin. What in the world had happened to her? It hadn't even been raining. Her thoughts were interrupted by another sharp rap on the door. She presumed the woman was back. But when she turned to open the door, she caught a glimpse of something in the window. It was a face, and not the face of the woman. The face of someone else. And someone else. And someone else. Outside of her house were a number of people all of different ages and all soaked to the bone. She didn't open the door. Across town, a civil servant had come to have a look around the desolate areas of the town. He had been tasked with reporting back to the powers that be his assessment of the situation, how much it would cost to bring the town back up to standard and what they needed to do. He stood at the edge of the town, Town is a generous word for it, maybe. Large village was probably a better term. Surrounding the village were fields, and fields, and fields of crops, all the way out to the sea. There was no one around. The fields were empty. The streets were empty. He looked out to the sea, and his breath caught at how much things had changed when something caught his eye. There, alone, in the middle of a field, was a woman. He blinked. No, she was still there. A woman, in the middle of a field, wearing a red dress. She was close enough to him that there was no mistaking that she was a woman in a red dress, standing in a field. But he couldn't make out her expression, and he couldn't make out why she was there. She was entirely out of place. 
The fields were sparse and empty and she was definitely not dressed for field work. Should he go and ask her if she was okay? I wonder what she lost. No one was around for miles, so what in the world was she doing there, standing silent and staring in the middle of a field? And then she was gone. Completely gone. He must have blinked or looked away for a fraction of a second because she had vanished, and he suddenly realised that the stories he had heard about this place were all true. A few months before all of this, Chisato awoke, sweating and crying. She cried out for her mother. Sayomi rushed to comfort her trembling daughter and sat with her arms wrapped around her, willing her to calm down and dry her tears. Chisato cried and cried and told her mother between heaving breaths that it was an earthquake, a giant earthquake. It took the school. The school is gone. It was just a nightmare. But Chisato had always been a sensitive child. She seemed to have been born with an intuition and understood the nuances of the people around her in a deeper way than any child should. She would sit diligently watching her father build furniture and other objects with his hands. He was a talented carpenter. Every time her father would need a new tool, Chisato would be stood waiting for him with the tool in her hand. He would never have to say anything. He would just think it. And Chisato would just know. Initially, her mother and father believed that she just had a keen eye and had simply been watching her father work for a longer time than they had realised. But when she started school, they realised that there was more to it than that. She would just know things. She knew people's thoughts, their worries and feelings before they even knew them themselves. She also hated school. With a passion. But she knew that skipping school or pretending to be sick would cause her mum to be fined. Even at 11 years old, Chisato was keenly aware of how her actions affected others. And that morning, after being awoken by her nightmare, she went to school. On the 11th of March... 2011, three catastrophic events rocked Japan. An earthquake, which triggered a massive tsunami, and the subsequent nuclear fallout of Fukushima power plant. The death toll from the tsunami in particular was enormous. When the water eventually subsided, over 18,500 people had lost their lives and countless homes, schools and businesses had been reduced to nothing. After the earthquake had happened, officials knew that a tsunami would come, and they did their best to evacuate as many people as possible, and as quickly as possible. But still the loss of life was second only to the atomic bombing of Nagasaki in 1945. Japan is regularly hit by small earthquakes, to the extent that buildings are designed to be earthquake safe and companies provide white helmets to workers as a safety precaution for such events. They regularly have earthquake and tsunami drills. In the days leading up to the 11th of March, Japan experienced several small tremors. This is not uncommon, but it can be a precursor to something much bigger. The earthquake that followed was so strong that it pushed the country of Japan 13 feet closer to America and knocked the earth six and a half inches off its axis. The footage was terrifying. When the water subsided, huge ships were deposited on city streets and cars had been dropped on the roofs of several story buildings by the 131 foot waves. The Tohoku region of northern Japan was the worst hit. The stories in this episode have been adapted from Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 2, Episode 4, Tsunami Spirits, and from a book by Richard Lloyd Parry called Ghosts of the Tsunami. These are the stories of real people. And what is striking is that huge amounts of people reported supernatural experiences after the disaster. 
more so than any other catastrophic event in Japan's history. Chisato never did come home from school that day. The taxi drivers continued to pick up the dead and bring them to long destroyed areas. From the temples, holy men conducted exorcisms on people who believed that they were being consumed by the lost souls of those who had died. Japanese people have lived alongside earthquakes and tsunamis since time began. Sometimes a tsunami would be a few inches high and cause small surges in the bay. Sometimes they would be tens of feet high and destroy everything they touched. Previous generations of survivors would leave markers in the land to stop future generations from building homes in harm's way. But with every tsunami came more ghostly tales. In 1876, a man named Fukuji survived a tsunami alongside two of his children. They built a ramshackle hut in the ruins of their home and tried to rebuild the life they had lost. One night, Fukuji awoke to go to the toilet and stood on the beach looking out to sea. The fog was rolling over the waves and from the mist, there emerged two figures. It was his wife and a man from the village who everyone knew had been in love with his wife but wasn't considered a suitable husband. They had both perished in the tsunami. He watched as they walked over the waves until they were close to him. His wife told him that she was happy and at peace. There are many explanations as to why these stories emerged after the tsunami. The sea, for many, is a symbol of plenty and provides sustenance and wealth for people. But it can also be dangerous and destructive. In 2011, over 18,000 people disappeared, perished in a heartbeat, and whole towns and villages were washed away. Many people were desperate for signs from their loved ones. Many people carried the unbearable weight of survivor's guilt. Many had faced their own micro-apocalypse, where their entire world as they knew it had ended. Maybe it's PTSD. Maybe it's all a result of the trauma. Maybe ghosts are their way of coping and of maintaining contact with those who were snatched away from them. Or maybe the souls of those who perished just weren't prepared to leave. Not just yet. Tsunamis are terrifying. I think particularly the footage of, of that that the 2011 one and the footage of the Christmas Eve 2007 2004 2004 I think it was the one that hit Indonesia was just just absolutely awesome in the sense of the power of nature but just so terrifying because everything that we've put on this earth looks so insignificant compared to the power of that wave and when I was reading the the book um, Ghost of the Tsunami which is a really good book but also a terrifying book. Apparently, a tsunami is the only thing in the world, so the only thing in the world more powerful than a tsunami is a meteorite hitting the earth or an atomic bomb, that's it. There is nothing in the world more powerful than a tsunami. And I guess in a way, like you can, so like in in Japanese buildings, you can account for earthquakes. You know, in their offices, they don't really put stuff on their walls, apparently, um, they have regular earthquake drills. Their buildings are built in a way to like withstand sway. earthquakes and sway. But with a tsunami, what do you do? And you you can't get out of the way and you can't swim from it. It's just terrifying, and such a massive loss of life and and structure and society just gone, just yeah. wiped off the face of the earth. Just absolutely horrendous. And it's really dark and there's, there's, you, you can't joke about these stories because they are the result of this massive loss of life. But I'd gotten, I think I've gotten about a bazillion 
messages and emails and and requests from people to cover this so we watched the unsolved mysteries documentary kind of thinking we not that it was going to be light watching but wow did i not expect it to be as harrowing as it was like i i i must i cried watching that episode and i also cried multiple times reading richard lloyd parry's book because it's incredibly sad and it's about how people manage loss so all of those stories that i told you are all different reports from different people who um worked or lived in the area that was most ravaged by the tsunami what were your thoughts what i found truly fascinating about those stories and about what we saw on the documentary which i I recommend everybody should go and watch if you've got access to netflix or if you know the other ways of watching things um was the volume the volume of sightings and I thought it was really interesting that they said that it doesn't even it power the number of ghost sightings is so much more than it is in in Hiroshima and Nagasaki where yeah. just equal amounts of loss of life equally not expecting it yeah it's just but I wonder is that down to so Nagasaki they they had somebody to blame you have a, a very physical human entity that you can say you did this whereas with a tsunami you've got this body of water that gives so much life to the area that suddenly becomes this destructive force it's just wild yeah i don't don't know if that really explains the ghost sightings though but you think like if you think about all of our scientific knowledge that we've got about ghosts huge amounts of scientific knowledge um, we have about ghosts collectively and just the things that were well, just the things that you hear about ghosts and energy and what causes it and stuff like that you think that the you think that there would be equal amounts in Nagasaki and Hiroshima because it's just that sudden loss of life without any expectation and actually the tsunamis are exactly the same but there's just this disparity in the number of of, of ghost sightings and part of me wonders and this is a bit left field but part of me wonders whether it's to do with resting places because I feel like a lot of the people that died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were literally vaporized, so there was nothing left of them. Like yeah. It was a shadow. Whereas there's potentially still bodies to be found. There were huge amounts of stories. So the book centers around this school that wasn't evacuated properly mm. and all the children that were there died, which is horrific. And it centers around the parents' search for the bodies of their children. So you can imagine why I cried so much reading this. I mean, like the story of Chisato is a real child. She had a really bad nightmare about an earthquake. She had lived her whole life around earthquakes, never really bothered her. Mm. She had this nightmare. She woke up in the morning. She didn't want to go to school, but she was like, fine, I'll go. I know you'll get fined if I don't get blah, blah, blah. And she was a sensitive child and they always Mm. thought that she was a really sensitive child. And then that was it. Yeah. She didn't come back and the school wasn't properly evacuated. So these parents were trying to find the bodies of these children for sometimes months on end. And some of them got psychics involved. I left out the stories about the psychics. I didn't use them because I felt like, not that I thought these psychics were trying to take advantage of these parents, but I think they were giving them comfort when they needed it mm. rather than it being any sort of genuine ghostly intervention and i also left out the huge amount of possession stories that occurred after the tsunami because i think most of them i read them and there's there's one on the unsolved mysteries and you can take away from them what you will but we kind of said quite a while ago that we weren't going to do possession stories anymore because so much of it comes down to mental health Mm. and for these people it was a huge amount of of like i said in the story survivors guild where they kind of thought how have i ended up here when my whole world has ended it's, it's, I find it very interesting and it's very hard to sort of comprehend it, the scale of it. But the, the taxi driver story is another one that really sort of resonated with me. The, the number of taxi drivers that were paying for journeys with ghost people. So they weren't publicly acknowledging that they paid for it, but they, they were running all these journeys where they'd, they were covering the cost because they felt like it was something they needed to do. And it was the same with the fire department wasn't it that you were talking about where they they were getting the ghost calls and they went because they felt like they needed to do it and that kind of links in with what you were saying about survive it being an element of survivor's guilt to it as well i guess because it's that it's that responsibility and and, and from lit what little i know about sort of japanese cultural practice it's, it's very much about responsibility and and loyalty and and 
ritual is not the right word, but that kind of politeness, politeness manners, yeah, yeah. manners, and, and doing the right thing, and and so it fits in with all of that in terms of that narrative. But then there's the other part of me that says, well, actually, you know, we always there's always a lot of discussion about the kind of energy that water brings to these kind of situations. You know, the, the element yeah. of water and and how like you know take it with a pinch of salt because it's Zach Bagans but you know how he's always talking about a water source providing additional energy for his sightings it seems to be something that, that you know along with lots of other stuff that goes in with that ghost ghost explanations water seems to be one of these things and then what you're dealing with is a mass loss of life by this energy force do you know what I mean so this giant wave is coming and taking it out and and that is the energy that's providing the energy to the situation on on mass so it's it's a it's it's something you can't comprehend and I don't think it's, it's it's equally something you can't explain away. Yeah, I agree. Like I, I, I'd love to sit here and go and, and there, in the Unsolved Mysteries documentary, there's um like um doctors and stuff who are on talking about their professors, their interpretation of what's happened. And they kind of settle on that it's survivor's guilt and PTSD and the, the, the collective trauma of what happened and whatever. But yeah, if it brings people comfort, you know, if people think I've seen the ghost of my loved one and actually a lot of the stories, they aren't even ghosts of loved no, they ones. Aren't even people they They're know. just strangers. Like the lady that saw the woman, the, the woman <clears throat> just presumed she was a woman that needed yeah. clothes. It's only after all these faces started appearing. That she suddenly went, oh, hang on a second. Yeah. Something's wrong here. But then it's what do you do in that situation? Because is it, is it that, that the fact that she helped that spirit, did that cause that spirit to pass on? And then... <laughs> And she got to help all those spirits to show up to help them pass on. Like. Give them all clothes. Yeah. I mean, you'd run out of clothes pretty pretty quickly. No, but again, it fits in with that sort of, again, minimal knowledge, but it fits in with that Japanese custom and tradition and the, the idea that they do, there's certain things that they do alongside burial to prepare them for the next life. It's almost that ritual giving of clothes is helping yeah. that spirit pass on. That fits in with that as well. But then I don't feel like we can sit here and say anything. Because, uh, uh, sorry, that sounded really judgmental. That's not what I meant. I mean, I don't. Obviously, we can say something, but I don't think we can have a definitive answer. No, we answer can't. To it because we haven't lived through one. Thankfully. One of the things that I took away from this is that I, and this is not to negate the trauma of a whole nation of people, but I, I, I read it and I went, we are so lucky to live in a temperate climate that is, you know, not on a tectonic plate anywhere. I, it just baffled me and there was there was another story that made my blood go cold but it wasn't paranormal so I didn't include it in the narrative bit but there was a a woman who obviously survived and the the earthquake they had the tremors for a couple of days and they were getting bigger and bigger and then they had the big earthquake and it was a really bad earthquake and she and the people in her office they all evacuated and the general thing that Japanese people know to do is when there's big earthquake you get to higher ground as soon as possible because if you're living on the coast it is likely there's going to be a tsunami so she knew there was a tsunami coming and she you know they've all experienced varying degrees of tsunami like I said a couple of inches to maybe a couple of feet and she ran out of the office and she said that she stood for a second and she couldn't it was so quiet and she couldn't figure it out it was like deathly silent like completely silent and she stood and it was only afterwards that she realised the reason it was deathly silent is because there was no waves at all because they had all retreated like they mm. do in a tsunami. And there was other people who had talked about like this little old man told a story about how the earthquake happened and he left his house and he lived beside a river that fed the sea and he walked out and looked and the river was empty mm. because all of the water had been sucked out to sea. And it just, I cannot imagine the fear those people felt at that moment of realisation that a tsunami was coming and it was going to be huge. I think we just forget, don't we? Because we've got so many powerful, in air quotes, things that we've created and invented that we actually we forget just how powerful nature is. Yeah. Until something like this happens on this scale. And it, it happens more regularly than you think or than you remember, I think. But it's it's terrifying. It's terrifying. And I can't I can't say anymore. <laughs> So if you enjoyed this week's episode, you can find everything you need to know about us on reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. You can send your own story to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can support our Patreon on patreon.com forward slash reallifeghoststories where for $5 or for $2 a month you get heaps of extra content. 
And today is our final day to be able to support Dan's Campaign Against Living Miserably campaign. Do you want to tell people a little bit of what it's about? Yeah, so for the last month, I've been playing a different horror game each night on stream. I've had to double up a couple of times due to different things, but we're at the 31 mark. We've been aiming to do 31 games of terror in October, um, including a 24-hour charity stream. And we were raising money for the Campaign Against Living Miserably, which is an excellent suicide awareness prevention and intervention charity based in the UK. And if you have got some spare cash, then the link for that is www.justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash 31 games of terror. And if you haven't got any money, um, you can just check out calmzone.net and see what a great, great job they do. And on that note, we shall see you next week. Bye.